Thank you guys for coming out today. My name is Scott Bergman. I'm part of the Talks at Google program here in Ann Arbor. And I have the distinct privilege of welcoming Drs. Jeff and Stanley DeGraff. Uh, to tell you guys a little bit about them, I'll give you a little background. Uh, at 25, Dr. Jeff DeGraff became uh, a senior executive at Domino's, which became one of the fastest growing companies in America. And not only that, he became a professor at the Ross School of Business here in Ann Arbor and has become a C-suite advisor to over half of the Fortune 500. Not only that, Jeff's ideas on innovation have been covered by the NPR and PBS, where he has been a featured columnist for Inc., Wired, Fortune, and Psychology Today, just to name a few. And we have Stanley DeGraff here today, who is the CEO of Innovatrium, a consulting and training practice here. And they also have offices in Atlanta and Ann Arbor. And she's also an innovation community builder where she runs innovation tournaments here in Detroit and is also the creator of the collaborative open innovation network used by the University of Michigan. All right, guys, well, come on up. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thanks, Google. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Scott. Pleasure. So what I want to do today is I want to challenge a lot of uh, probably your most sacred notions about innovation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my work and, and uh, what we know about how innovation actually produces value and destroys value. Uh, to do that, it's going to be like an old Western movie where we're going to start with the long shot you know, of, of the city of Dodge, and then we're going to move into the tumbleweed street. And then finally, we're going to look at uh, the sheriff, right? We're going, to, we're going to talk about you. So I want to start with a little backstory here. Um, I'm all, both Stanley and I are technologists. We're trained as technologists. That's what our advanced degrees are in. Um, but interestingly enough, whenever I'm a, a anywhere in an airport and I travel a lot, somebody always wants to stop and tell me about new technology. They have you heard about the latest thing? And I'm sure you guys get this all the time. And it's some of it's apocryphal, you know, that we're being it's, uh, technology is coming from aliens, and some of it's uh, some of it's stuff that you've already seen or you already know. But but you all know that technology happens, and the cycle of technology, the magnitude and momentum of technology, always increases over time. And there's a bunch of laws about this. I won't bore you with that. But around uh, around the late '80s, I got a call from an editor at Life Magazine, and she wanted to talk to me about innovation. So I thought she wanted to talk to me. And she said, no, I want you to give a commentary. We're writing a piece on the 100 most important people of the 20th century, and one of them is related to you. Now, this was a huge surprise. I don't know any, most people are related to me, not doing so well, right? So there, she talked about this man named Charles Fair de Graff. And she sort of, you know, I was embarrassed. I didn't know who this person was. Uh, no, you know, nobody told me about him. So when she got off the phone, I looked him up. And he was the guy who created pocket books. He created paperback books in the 1930s. And his whole idea with this technology was that people would become literate. If books were cheap, two bits, people would become literate. But they didn't. And the reason it stuck with me, I was doing a project with Alan Kay and Steve Jobs in the state of California to try and develop literacy for uh, people who, had, who were uh, uh, underserved. And we had the exact same result. We didn't get any results from introducing technology into the situation. And so very early on, that began to galvanize my thoughts about culture and the role of culture in technology and how, in some ways, culture overtakes or co-ops technology. So what I want to talk about today is that innovation isn't really an invention. It's not just a gadget. It's not, you know, it's not next to the cool thing. It actually has a lot to do with identifying patterns, how those patterns go together, identifying how culture and competency interact with those patterns. And I want to give some examples of that. But I want to start with this whole notion of dominant logic. And it's a really big thing for Google. And you're getting a lot of sort of press, negative press about this. And that is one of the things that goes on in our world. We sometimes call this in business micro-segmentation. The notion is we have a tendency to identify and value people who are like us. Right? That's kind of one of the big challenges. And when social media started, I started writing articles that got a lot of uh, negative attention, saying that I wasn't sure that social media was really uh, creating this kind of inclusive society, that in some ways it was micro-segmenting us. The people who are your friends, even though they might look different and they may seem different, they actually believe all the same nonsense you believe. And if they don't believe it, what do you do? 
You, on a dark night, on a dark road, you unfriend them. The Spanish Inquisition couldn't have thought of this. So the notion is we get these very vertical segments. So if you've ever talked to anybody about religion or politics, you know what I mean by the whole notion of dominant logic. And it comes back to what that crazy philosopher Schopenhauer said you know, over a century ago. Every man, every person takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits of the world. And that's kind of where we're at. Now, I'm going to make the argument that this is the problem of modernity, and there's a way to solve this to get over this. So the key is how do we get beyond this dominant logic? How do we develop a mindset to actually be more inclusive? And I'm going to talk about inclusiveness in a way that's very different than you've probably heard it, because it's not just politically correct. It's not just morally correct. It's essential for innovation. I'm going to prove it to you. Now, it turns out that every organization has to do two things. And boy, Google, this is really relevant to you. The first thing an organization has to do is maintain itself. It has to, pr it has to pr produce predictable outcomes. This is why capitalism requires capitalists. Whether you're a private equity, whether you're publicly traded, somebody has to show that you're going to do things on a normal basis. And the way that that happens is we get rid of variance. We create standards. We call this operating rhythm. Right Now, the notion is that makes, us, that makes us all predictable. But the problem is, just like people, we want to grow. So to grow, instead of eliminating deviance, what we need to do is introduce it. So innovation, by definition, is a form of deviance. And so we're going to have this tension. And it's not a, a tension of type. It's not I'm an ENTP or an INFJ. It's not that. It's one form of value actually literally assaults the other. One form of value destroys the other. I want you to think about high growth economies versus high quality or productive economies. They're oppositional, and there's a reason. One is creating standards, and one is creating deviance. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to seem very radical to you. This tension, when used properly, is actually not only good, it's the basis of the growth engine. So, let me give some examples of culture and how culture co-ops technology. Interestingly enough, everybody talks about Tesla. And it's a great technology, and I love Tesla. But here's the problem. Tesla last year sold 55,000 cars, and they lost $600 million. Now, they're not going to lose $600 million going forward, and they're going to sell maybe twice as many cars. But the notion is we've had some soft quarters in the automobile industry, haven't we? Tesla hasn't destroyed the automobile industry, right? What's affecting the automobile industry is Uber. Now, I want you to think about Uber for a minute. Where's the innovation in Uber? Ride sharing. I'm an old guy. We had ride sharing when I was a kid. You called the parish priest. You called the coach. You got a ride. Look at the app that they use. Doesn't it look like 2007 over-the-road trucking app? It's not a particularly well-run company. There's all kinds of legal problems with it. Where's the innovation in Uber? Young people like you will get in the car with a stranger. Right? It's a social innovation. I won't. It's like Airbnb. All of a sudden, the car is not just something you drive. It's something you take someone in. Airbnb. If someone came to my house, I have, I have a nice house on the Huron River, and use my towel, I'd take it in the backyard, burn it, and bury it. I'd sick the dogs on them, right? The notion is this social form of innovation has co-opted this. Same is true for Goldman Sachs. Anybody remember about four years ago, not even four, three years ago, the number one selling book on the New York Times nonfiction book was, nonfiction list was a book called Flash Boys by Michael Lewis. It was about spread networks. The notion was Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse were trading a little faster than you were, could, could trade. So they got the uplift on a stock and they got to sell, get rid of the stock. They got to short the stock as it started to go down. Now think of it this way. They're the bookie. Doesn't matter whether Michigan or Ohio State wins, the bookie always makes money. That's what this deal was. And everyone said the fix is in, the 1% is going to get richer and richer until what started happening? Until cryptocurrencies started to come in. And that's what you young people, right? Now, where did cryptocurrencies start? And don't say the 98 paper. That's not where it started. Where it really started was in money laundering. It started with drug cartels. Where did streaming really start? I mean, in earnest. Where did that new technology come from? The porn industry, right? Where did emoji start? It started in terrorist cells. So one of the things I want to point out right off the bat is that technologies are often used or first adapted by groups that they're not intended for. Anybody see the problem that happened in Amazon right before Christmas? Their little recommendation engine, the little problem that showed up in the New York Times? If you like fertilizer, you might like black powder and ball bearings, right? 
The notion is technology is powerful. When we start looking at people who are making uh, these smartphones going back a decade, it's only been a decade, th th in their wildest dreams, they never imagined that you would use the camera to take pictures of yourself. They thought you'd be at Yellowstone and taking the vistas and things like that. So culture has this mitigating factor where what you want technology to do is completely different. And think about the 13 indictments two weeks ago that Mueller has made. So the notion is this culture piece is not only confounding it actually does something more powerful. And the biggest industry to look at for this right now is pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceutical industry is reeling. Why is it reeling? Because all of these big pharmaceutical companies are all of the sudden having to compete with young people like yourself who've got together in a federation deal, and they have names like Bios Forum and, the Open Fo uh, the, and Firestorm and things like that. And what they're doing is they're developing medications and therapies and drugs, and they're open source patenting them. Right? So the notion is, here's the question. I was at Duke the other day, and I was talking to the head of their law school, and I said, where are all your lawyers going these days? Because it's tough to get a job if you're a lawyer. And they said, pharmaceuticals. Well, the answer is simple. What are they doing in pharmaceuticals? They're trying to protect their intellectual property. Here becomes the question for you. Who's going to win this bar fight? Is it going to be the millions of people who are trying to do things for free in this open source, or is it going to be a handful of sort of these very monopolistic kind of companies that are trying to protect the intellectual property? That's why we're seeing these companies start in places that, that don't have strong intellectual property laws, Tanzania, places like that, parts of the Philippines, Cebu, other kinds of places. So I want to take a step back. So there's this big trend. This trend towards technology coming out of places and people doing different things with it because of culture. And then this other big trend, of the challenge between organizations trying to control things, we're going to call this, uh, we're going to call this uh, longitude, and organizations networking, and we're going to call this latitude, right? Longitude and latitude of organizations. Well, how does innovation actually relate to all this? It has to start with what's our definition. About 1993, I got to write the definition for the federal government for innovation, and all I did was co-opt a very famous definition from innovation from the 1960s from Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan said innovation has four attributes. He said, first of all, an innovation enhances something. Well, here we are, Google. Were you the first search engine? No. What, did, what, did, you, you know, did you have the same sort of format as other for, uh, search engines? No, you had a little box. And what Google made better was not so much it was a faster search or a better search at the beginning. It was an easier search. It was a simpler search. Right? So you made it better by simplifying it. Now the second thing is an innovation has to eliminate something. What does the innovation kill? Now that's a tough one, right? I want you to think about what did Charles Schwab kill? Does everybody remember brokerage houses? The big brokerage houses in, on Fifth Ave and down on Wall Street? They're all gone now. E.F. Hutton, the quiet company, is really quiet. Why? Because we disintermediated the broker. Basically, we let trading happen directly. Of course, this is an industry you have a lot of interest in, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, stakes in the ground here. It has to return us to something. Here's an interesting one. It has to make us feel like we're, like we're do we need to do something here? We're OK? All right. It, it has to make us feel like we're returning to something. So think about it. What are the big trends in restaurants right now? Is it faster food or is it slow food, whole food? Farm to table, right? And the ultimate, the ultimate returning us to something we feel we lost was developed about two blocks that direction, which was Viagra, right? The 25 again. And finally, the most important thing McLuhan said, and I've got your little logo up here, right? The most important thing McLuhan said, he said, over time, an innovation reverses into its opposite, the anti-innovation. Does anybody remember when, when email was going to set you free? Anybody remember that? Yeah, and now what? We're all slaves. Right? We can't put our phone down. We're all slaves to email and, 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 and uh, SMS and everything else. Now, I'm going to add a few things to McLuhan. Number one, innovation is a form of useful novelty. All that means is it can happen anywhere. Innovation can happen anywhere. So I want you to think about Starbucks for a minute. It's a commodity. The Egyptians had it. It's something that's been around for 3,000 years. Where's, where's the innovation in Starbucks? Well, it's theater. Right? It's the whole experience of going to Starbucks, and they have names for everything. Innovation pays in the future. It's what's called a convex form of value. How much data do we have in the future? Anyone? How much data? So I'm coming home from Shanghai the other day, and this guy sitting next to me says, the dollar, is it going up or down? And I said, it's going down. And he said, why do you say that? And I said, because it's up, and that's what currencies do. They go up and down, duh. And he said, what? He said, when? And I said, I don't know when. If I knew when, I'd be George Soros. I'd be speculating the dollar. And I sure wouldn't be telling a pathetic loser like you about the dollar. 
So the point is, the biggest form of resistance to innovation is excessive planning or getting stuck in the planning cycle. Have you been to the meeting about the meeting? <laughs> Have you seen the report about the report? Yeah, you're the big guys now, you used to be the small guys. Right, so someone else is running the experiment right now where you're doing that. And finally, innovations have a shelf life. They go sour like milk. So the other day, I'm in Chicago. I'm giving the keynote speech for the American Medical Association. I'm feeling pretty good about this. It's a big, it's a big meeting. But I notice on Michigan Avenue, the line goes all the way down Michigan Avenue. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, there's a lot of people here hear my silly talk about innovation. And then it occurs to me, what's being released? The new Apple iPhone is being released. And they're basically in line to get the new iPhone. Of course, what happens to the old iPhone the minute the new iPhone is, is introduced? It's rubbish, right? It's discounted. It falls off the commodity cycle. So the big challenge of innovation is it's only an innovation for a moment in time. So this is what an innovation is, which means it can happen in the supply chain, it can happen in marketing, it can happen in the product itself. It's a lot more than the gadget. So there's other mythologies I think that people have about innovation I wanted to spell you of. First of all, innovative organizations have very little in common. When we start looking at the indexes for innovation, and there's about, there's about seven that started. There's about 13 legitimate ones now. There's hundreds of other ones. But let's say out of 13 ones, there's about 15% of the companies that they have in common, which tells you right off the bat that they're not talking about the same thing. Two, money is almost never a barrier to innovation. Now, if you know this, one of the big issues is money often creates uh, a, a constraint when you have less money that you have to have an interesting workaround, and we could talk about how the economy is flush with money right now because the tax cut and all the repatriation of the money is going to put about a trillion, maybe two trillion dollars back in this economy. So the notion is, is this really going to go to innovation? Is it going to go to stock buyback? Is it, is it going to go to private equity? Where's the money going to go? Competitors often compete in opposite ways. So this is one that relates to you. Google, you have how many companies now? 58, 59 companies, right? You make everything. You're open source, man, right? Apple Apple what? Apple makes what? They make nothing, right? Foxconn and Invitec and a consortium of companies make Apple's product. They make design and they make brilliant designs. You have to give that to Apple. And the other thing they make is they make a closed operating system, right? In their ecosystem, it's not just different than yours. It's almost oppositional. Right? One's playing offense, one's playing defense. So, so the whole idea that people, even in the same kind of, in a Venn diagram, you're not in the exact same industry, but in related industries, compete the same way they don't. Incumbents are almost never first movers. This is what you have to worry about Google. Right? Think about it as a bar fight. Anybody from a blue collar neighborhood like I am? Anybody from a blue collar neighborhood? Yeah, you're from the same neighborhood I am, right? The notion is, who throws, is a big guy with a Budweiser jacket or is it the little guy with crazy eyes? It's the little guy. We call this in business first mover advantage. And this is why startups throw the first punch, because they can't compete on scope or scale. So when I start looking at what's happened with Google, I think your cap value this morning is like $680 billion. I think you're the second or third most valuable company in the world. You're no longer a startup. And the real challenge here is what? Getting you to act like you're a startup. I look at your new building, your beautiful building. I see all the trappings. Remember, I built Domino's. I helped build Domino's in the 1980s, which was the fastest growing company in the world in the 1980s. The interesting thing is at some point, you're going to have that real challenge of maintenance versus growth. It turns out that breakthrough happens at the edges of the bell curve. We'll talk about that later, because that's a very important point. And this is a point that Stanley's going to talk about, which is when we started looking at innovation indexes in 1993, less than 1% of them on a regular basis beat the growth benchmark on Wall Street. So the notion is most of what you believe about innovation is untrue. And we're going to talk about why it's untrue. There's only one thing that we're pretty sure we know about innovation, and this is going to be the key to the whole discussion today, and that is diversity happens in the 30 to 50 places on the planet that produce almost all the intellectual property. And when we look at these places, whether it's Tel Aviv, whether it's part of Shanghai, whether it's uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, or whether it's Palo Alto, where, you know, Cary, North Carolina, wherever you're at, one of the things you're going to see is it looks very different than any place if you drove 40 miles outside of the city boundaries, right? And one of the things we see is that people are very different. I'm going to talk about why that's so important. Now, remember the whole idea that I started with talking about the magnitude of innovation and the momentum or the speed and magnitude. The two things you have to think about is how much and how fast. That's the question you always must ask yourself. How much innovation and how fast? Is a meteor careening towards the earth? It's going to kill us all. We better do something now. Or is it that the, the ice caps are melting and we probably should do something in the next four or five years in order to get our, a handle on this, right? Maybe it's even a little more urgent than that. Who knows? But the first thing that companies do is they build a process. Now, here's a question to you. Does process create deviance or eliminate deviance? What does process do? It eliminates deviance. 
Yeah. So the first thing we do to make innovation happen is what? We build something to eliminate innovation. And this is what we do in business schools. This is stage gating, this is portfolio management, these are hurdle rates. So the notion is we're trying to gain control because what we really want from innovation is what? We want predictable revenue. We want predictable things. So by definition, when you build a process, you're gonna be incremental because that's what processes are designed to do. That's what that tool is designed to do. Now what if we really wanted to do something with much higher magnitude for innovation? Wouldn't we have to change the gene pool? It's like a great sports team, or an orchestra, or a band, or a great chef. Wouldn't we have to go out and get people, right? How long does it take to, 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 to develop a tremendous innovator here at Google? A long time, or a professor at Michigan, or Stanford, or Harvard, wherever you, you know, wherever you came from, wherever you are. So the notion is, this type of innovation is much higher, but harder to do. That's why Google spends a lot of money on you, developing you, because that's really important. We do the same thing at Michigan. Now finally, if I really, really want to change culture, what I, what, if I really want to change the culture to make innovation happen, is that going to happen overnight? It takes forever. Now I'm going to say something that's really controversial. There's only two ways to change culture because culture isn't a thing you can touch. Culture is in the ether. Culture is the way you talk. It's their mindset. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the way you interact. It's not a thing. Culture is contained in two things. Number one, it's contained in leadership, how you lead. What do we do if you're acquiring an underperforming firm? What is the first step when you acquire an underperforming firm? You got it there, right? Knuckle bump. You get rid of the senior suite. The Chinese have a wonderful saying, the fish stinks from the head. They have a wonderful saying for everything. But that's what that means. That means you got to get rid of people because culture is contained in leadership. And if you got great leaders, you get golden handcuffs. Oh, they're going to stay for two or three years. The second thing that changes culture is how you work. Now, I worked on a project that most of you know is Ecoimagination. It's the first $30 billion spend on the green uh, technology that General Electric did. Well, one of the things that people get wrong about that is it was not just to, to, uh, to change the, the game about uh, power, which, which it was partially, but it was also to try and figure out how to get 28 divisions of one of the world's largest companies to work in sync. So you either change how people lead, or you change how they work. That's how culture gets changed, but it takes a long time. So the, the issue is we all know what's required, but are we willing to put the time in? So what's the answer? Well, one of my favorite answers comes from an old, uh, an old philosophy called the Tao. And you're going to see that a lot of my, a lot of, um, um, of, of my work and Stanley's work really relates from this old Chinese idea that's about 200 years before Plato is around. People start writing about this. And at the heart of the Tao is the notion of the yin and the yang, Constri the, the notion that there are conflicting forces in the universe. And these conflicting forces produce hybrids. They create new ways of doing things. Well, from this, the Chinese have done something remarkable. I've spent a lot of time in China over the years. The Chinese uh, developed a, a, a way of thinking called the I Ching. And it's called, sometimes called the Book of Changes. People use it for, uh, you know, like for predicting the future. But it's really used so that people can think through all the options that they've got. This is sometimes called heuristics or cognitive algorithms. Finally, out of this, there's a lot of how-to books. And the most famous one is a book called The Art of War, right, written by Sun Tzu. Whether that's a real person or not, it's a real controversy, right? And then finally, the family household, how to use this uh, for day in and day out, well, feng shui, right, the whole notion of a lupin, the whole notion of having a compass to put this together. And what it means is you don't have to have inputs and outputs and process because you're thinking the way I'm thinking. And you're looking at all the options so I don't have to supervise you and tell you what to do. Well, this is the heart of our thinking and this is the heart of our book. We had this sort of revelation in the early 1990s and that was the most innovative companies, when we start looking at predictability of what was going to make an innovative company, were companies that had constructive conflict. Now, this is important because when I talk about constructive conflict, I'm not talking about talking disrespectfully to people. That's not what I mean. I don't mean marginalizing people. I mean we have fond regard, filial piety, collegial piety for each other. Hopefully we, have, we like each other, maybe love each other. But it means when it comes to ideas, we engage. <clears throat> now, engagement usually means, we talk about engagement, oh, you really like being here at work. No. When we start looking at innovation, it means you have an idea and I have an idea, and they're different ideas. Instead of being on social media and us sniping at each other, us trolling each other, I'm going to engage you. I'm going to skid nose to nose to you and say, I think it should be like this. And you're going to say, I think it needs to be like this. Now, this is a caution to millennials. This is not an opportunity for, for, for compromise. 
This is trying to push this to the new place. The next idea, the third way, a new way. This becomes the generative power of innovation, where you do it all. Think about it for a minute. Think about the healthcare debate. I got to give my TED talk when President Obama rolled out the Affordable Health Care Act at the White House. It was great. The, the problem is you got one group that says it should all be public, and the other group says it should all be private. Are those really our options? Aren't the options everything in between, and how do we take that forward? Right? We spend a trillion dollars basically yelling at each other, yelling over the fence. So my point about social media is we haven't had conflict. We've had yelling at each other, but no one is engaged. Is everybody following us? So the thing is, we're going to engage ideas. So there, there is no such thing as a safe place. It means if we talk respectfully, we're going to engage. And this means at the heart of innovation is this concept of diversity. So diversity is more than just a moral issue, and of course it is a moral issue, but it's more. And it's not just the color of your skin. It's, not, it's your belief system. It's your cognitive maps. It's how you interact. It's your profession. So to do this, <coughs> Stanley and I built our model on Quinn and Cameron's model. Now, Bob Quinn had been here, I believe. And he was sort of one of my mentors, along with C.K. Prahalad and Rudolf Arnheim. Um, Quinn, this is their model called the Competing Values Framework. We took it towards the innovation direction. did a lot of research on it over the past 30 years. And it's uh, often referred to as the innovation genome, if you read the popular literature, the innovation code. So we're the developers of that. It basically says there are four types of innovators, and they compete against each other. And the, the key to innovation is following these these kitty corner competitions and looking for hybrids. So I'm going to explain what each of these means in just a minute. But to put it, uh, to put it uh, simply, <clears throat> innovation has longitude and latitude. There are two continuums in which you have to look at. And if you can figure out those two continuums, the most important thing are the dynamics between the opposites. Now I want to emphasize, this is not an opposite of type. This is not an opposite of style. This is what you're trying to create destroys what I'm trying to create. So when quality goes up, you reduce errors, right? And innovation goes down. <clears throat> when innovation goes up, I in introduce errors. This is sometimes called economy at risk, <clears throat> right? So there's a trade-off. What we're saying is when these two things show up together, what we've learned in our research is those stocks over time outperform all the other stocks. Right? And they outperform the indexes that people have. So these conflicts are going to become central. So let me talk a little bit about the conflicts. Now, first of all, this is not just about you. I like to call these Russian matryoshka dolls or Russian nesting dolls. Right? I don't know. Do you do this? I read self-help books, and then I go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to Traverse City, and I'm, going to, I'm going to just going to quit my job, and I'm going to, I'm going to write a crappy uh, science fiction novel. That's what I'm doing. And I've worked hard in my life, made a little money. I'm doing OK. I'm chucking it all. That's what I'm doing. Everybody get to that point? I've had enough of this. Yeah, but there's another nesting doll on my nesting doll. It's called I'm Married. And I have three children, and I have a dean, and I have business partners, and I have people who count on me, right? Yeah, that's the other part. And then what happens after that is there's the real world. That's the big nesting doll. There's a pandemic. There's a war. There's a financial crisis. Boy, you young people got blown out bad. No, wait, I, that was pretty bad. <clears throat> yeah. The notion is you don't act alone, do you? You act in, in accordance to your community, and you act in accordance to the situation. So it's not about you. It's not about I'm this type and that's all equal. That's not what's going on. What's going on is there's situational effectiveness. And it's not situation like this is awkward, like it's a social situation. It's like what's happening in the outside world and how do you need to act to do this. It's like playing a sports game, like football or soccer. Whatever you follow, there's a time that you do a certain sort of things because it's appropriate to do it at time. Surgeons, the same way. So let's look at the first one. <clears throat> the first one is the creative type or the artist type. I was really lucky when I was young. I got to be an advisor to Steve Jobs. It was great. Uh, you know, Walt Disney was one of my heroes. Anybody like Disney? You know, other than he had, he had some opinions that were not very cool, <clears throat> but he did some cool stuff. Um, think about uh, Elon Musk. Think about Tesla, not just a company, but the Nikki Tesla and all that kind of stuff. So what's interesting about this type of person is that they're very good in unique situations, things we haven't seen before. We're trying to cure an incurable disease. We're going into a battlement situation we've never seen before. You know, as meteors careening towards the Earth. It's highly unique. So that you're making it up as you go along. There isn't really a lot of precedence for these people. They have a high tolerance for ambiguity, they love ambiguity. Right? They love to spread the field. They love to try stuff. My favorite example of this is the Large Hadron Collider. Anybody remember three years ago the Bose, the God particle? 
right? Here we are in, at CERN in Switzerland. We have seven Nobel Prize winners. Two believe it would create a black fissure. Do you remember this? They thought it would create a black hole and destroy the universe. They bet a beer and pulled the switch. See you in hell, Jurgen. These are these guys. They're going to drive the Harley into the pool, right? But they're going to see the future first because they're looking for it. So the organizations are very ad hoc. They're making it up as they go along. They're morphing. People are coming. They're going into these organizations. And the artists themselves, what they really want is they want to be creative. They're serial monogamous. They don't like staying in their job. They're always looking at a new thing. They're all ADD, every last one of them. They pick up every pretty pebble on the beach. You know what I mean? This is the, it's a Fellini movie. This is that group. It's a Grateful Dead concert. You know, Jerry's playing. Mickey's in the bus. The girl in the white dress has had too many mushrooms, and she's spinning. You know, the spinners. You're probably too young to remember all this. That's what's going on here. This is this group of people. So they have a high degree of innovation, but their speed is relatively moderate because the, the, the delta is very large. Something's going to happen tomorrow, others when hell freezes over. But the biggest problem is they're high risk. Right? Oh, that blew it up real good. You remember last fall? SpaceX blew up a billion dollar rocket and they blew Facebook's rocket to it. The oh, that blew it up. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, this is this group of people. <clears throat> So where we find them? We find them taking risks. We find them in strategy. We find them in the arts. I bet some of you were, wanted to be in the arts, and you sort of are in the arts, aren't you? Right? Look at the, yeah, look at sheepish looks. Because what you really want is freedom, and you're held together by your vision. Right? So one of the things I learned real early when, in, in being around these people, the early days of Silicon Valley, were these visionaries who used to be like foul of the dead or ski bums. Right? And then they built these companies, including your own. Right? And how? The opposite of this group can engage this group is do things like understand that this group is going to try and make problems bigger, not smaller. This group doesn't want an answer. They want to, they want to play. So bring a fifth of Jack Daniels and some crayons. You're going to do some coloring, right? This is this group. They're never going to be on time, right? They, they, they're, these, these are these people, right? <clears throat> now, the opposite are the responsible people, the engineers. I call them autonomous man. I'm autonomous man. I've thought of it coming in here today. It came fully formed from my forehead like Athena. And they like, quietly sing, hi-ho, hi -ho. These are these guys. They know the right way and wrong way to do things, and they'll point it out to you. They love to tell you, you know, Jeff, that's the wrong way to do that. I'm on all these famous journals, and all these other journal guys in the journal love to tell me all the stuff I'm not doing right. You know, Jeff, you didn't evaluate. I'm like, I got it. Okay, we wear funny hats. We have medieval ceremonies, the whole nine yards. So these people are going to be in predictable situations where there's a lot of scale and failure is not an option. So you're going to see three things. Scale, right? We're, we're, we're selling a lot of something. We're going to see complexity. Think about Boeing in the new, the new 87th. It has 2 million moving parts. And, and the whole notion is, you, you know, if you, set, you bring that down the wrong way, it goes kaboom. Bad things happen. You operate the wrong way. You send the young men and win, women off to combat. Bad things happen. Now, interestingly enough, my favorite example of predictable is McDonald's. Some illiterate kid presses a cheeseburger button. And simultaneously, somebody shoots a cow in Argentina, bang, and everything in between happens. And Smithers, come here. These are these guys, right? They want everything to work. And ironically, in Google, as in Amazon, a lot of your success is here. It's not in the green. It's here, right? You're running a back office, very intricate supply chain is what you're doing with algorithms all over the place. So it's all about efficiency and quality, where the other one was about innovation and growth, radical innovation and growth. This is innovation to make things more efficient and make them work. And the people who run this, we're going to call them engineers. It's all about security and productivity, right? The whole idea of doing the right way and the wrong way. So you see that these are quite different than, from each other. So these people are very good where there's large scale projects. We're going to build something really big, like this whole campus up here, uh, Google. And we're going to have a right way and a wrong way. We're going to get these people who have uh, technical degrees, engineering, medicine, the sciences. And what these people want is they want responsibility because what they seek is they seek process. And the reason they use process is because what they have to do is take the vision that the artist has and they have to materialize it. They have to build the stupid thing. <clears throat> right? And incidentally, artists, one of the things you love to tell the engineers is it's 80% done. What's it really mean? It's 20% done on a good day. You're not any, and the artists will take credit for everything, don't they, engineers? They take credit. Yeah, that's the way the artists are. They crow about it. So what you can do, artists, when dealing with an engineer? One, show up on time. You know, you think they don't notice. 
Oh, the engineers are the most passive aggressive group you got here. And on a dark night, on a dark road, you'll disappear. They got a file on you like J. Edgar Hoover, right? They absolutely watch you, right? No, look at, yeah, you know this, right? The notion is look at the data, actually read the data. Right? How about that for a change? And follow the accepted form. And in the book, there's a lot of uh, keys about this. Now, here's the point. The point is the success of this group comes down to your ability to partner with the opposite. So the first thing I'm telling you is on a very personal level, the person who makes you crazy is probably what's missing in your ability to grow as a person and your ability to add value to the organization. Is everybody following us? Number two. You have to manage appropriately to the outcome you want. So if I want the engineer outcome, I have to use process. It's complicated. If I want the artist outcome, I'm going to change the gene pool and I'm going to hedge. That's why startups run the way they do, because they can't compete on scope or scale. So the notion is I, I've got a screwdriver, a hammer, a wrench, and a saw. They're great tools. They're not interchangeable. And that becomes the first challenge. Now we have to encounter the other. That's the key. I want you to think about your own organization. Think about Larry and Serge. You see this? They're opposite. Lennon and McCartney, right? You're going to see this over and over again. You have to find the person that makes you crazy. So I like superheroes. So this is Johnny Storm, the, the flame. Incidentally, superheroes need to be more inclusive. I couldn't find any sort of balanced superheroes, so I'm sorry about that. But we'll have to get Stan Lee to work on that a little more. Maybe some of the new ones I don't know about. And then we got uh, Richards here, who's sort of the red, the red genius guy. Well, let's turn this around and talk about uh, one of my favorite groups, which is the compete group, the blues. These are the athletes. I teach at the Ross School of Business where we grade on a curve. Right? And we have sayings like, don't send your ducks to Eagle School. And it's like the University of Chicago or Wharton or MIT. Right? The whole notion is it's competitive, that what we're trying to develop are athletes, people who are positive, they're forward moving, but the notion is they're ready to compete. They're ready to do what needs to be done. So these are people who are very good in contentious situations. So last week, I was the keynote speaker at the Air Force, their big annual convention. Right? You want athletes in your military services, right? Because what their job is what? Is to keep everybody safe. That's their job. So they're going to be aggressive in demanding situations. So whether you're a sports team and it's Michigan competing against Ohio State, or whether you're competing for potato chips, or you're making smartphones, this is where there's someone else coming after you, right? And we always make fun of these people until we need them. Then we need them, then we then all, oh, then it's all a different deal. Right? These are MBAs. These are business people. right? And they're very market-based organizations, meaning they face outside and they're beholden to shareholders or they're beholden to guidance. They have something that they've told people they're going to accomplish. So they're very interested on speed and profitability. The notion of profitability, even in a nonprofit, is our, you know, have we got bigger endowment? You know, Michigan likes to say, you know, we're not interested in that. But of course, the truth is all the best schools have what? They have these huge endowments. Right? And that's kind of the score. And finally, these people are all about vitality and prosperity. And you must have some of these people because I'm walking around your building, you got a gym, and people are tracking how, you know, how are they fit, and are they doing stuff, and who's in first place, and who's in last place, and top 10 and bottom 10. So you're not fooling me, Google. You got these guys too. And we need these people. We're going to find these people in a lot of places. We're going to find them wherever the challenge is results driven. These are get it done people, and they get it done very quickly. These are not long cycle people. So they're going to look where where the goals are focused, like we have to make the quarter, where we've got a problem, we've got to solve. Something didn't work and it's got to work. But more importantly, more importantly, we're going to find these people where challenges and resources result in some kind of a score. Now, what the sages can do. This is going to be an interesting thing because I have to warn you about blues. Boomers in the United States are typically blues. You know what? When I came to college, I came to college as a wrestler. I got a got to come college as a wrestler, and that meant somebody got a gold medal, and the rest of you were pathetic losers and either went to therapy or learned to drink. That's what it was. That my generation, you ever watch the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer thing at Christmas, and you think Santa Claus is a total jerk? Yeah, that, that's my generation, right? We went to the moon, we licked the commies, we built the net. <coughs> right? That's us. But our children are not those people. Our children have a little trouble with our goal centricity, our focus on goals, why we're obsessed with goals, how, why we compete and fight over everything. It's very confusing. Well, our children are these sages, and sages collaborate. So they're very good at cooperative uh, uh, the lifestyle things. They're very good at searching and reimplying ideas. They're very good at sharing. 
right? They don't like the idea of intellectual property. They don't like the idea that somebody owns something, asymmetries. They have a very democratic notion of the world, a very inclusive, a very consensus notion of the world in general, right? In general, these are generalities. Interestingly enough, their organizations are very clannish very community or oriented, very network oriented. So you're connecting to people that you want to connect with, that you share some kind of personal affinity for. You're very values oriented, right? Where the boomers are goal oriented, you're values oriented. And I believe this is creating the largest cultural shift in my lifetime. It's not like the 60s. I want to tell you three things about young people that you probably already know. Over half of all live births to women under the age of 30 starting in 2014 are outside of marriage. The more educated the woman is, the less likely she is to marry. Marriage is no longer normative. I've been married forever, right? She's been married to me forever, right? The notion of what you want to do for a living here at Google, is this a lifetime event at Google? You're going to be here forever? Interestingly enough, according to the Pew Charitable Trust, who, what do you really want out of life? You want to have impact, you want to make meaning, you want to take time off to cure river blindness in Tanzania because you care about, cu about cu culture, right? As opposed to my generation. And finally, the other thing that's very big is when we ask young people what their religious affiliation is, the number one growth area is what? No affiliation, right? So if you're talking to a boomer, I've been married forever, right? I'm a practicing Roman Catholic and I'm a capitalist pig. Right, I teach in a business school. So we're different about this. It doesn't mean we can't get along, and it doesn't mean we don't have a lot to teach each other. But the notion is, and, it's, and it's, I'm doing this in a very gross way, obviously, to sort of teach this. But I also want to point out that the Chinese are a clannish culture. They're the opposite of American culture. American culture became American culture in a very ballistic way, in a very hard way. I want you to think about 2008, September 15th, when Lehman uh, crashed. Between September 15th and January 1, we laid off 6 million people. Bang, bang, bang. Right? But we also hired them back faster. This culture doesn't, right? Takes care of people because it's value centric, but also takes longer to bring them back. So it's a long cycle culture. We find these people in community service, places where, where conflict is managed. We find these people where we're, we're dealing with people in a way that we're trying to, we're trying to help them develop. We're trying to mitigate, uh, we're trying to mitigate conflict. And we're going to find these people where, where harmony is paramount, where people are respecting each other in a way that they don't, uh, they don't have the kind of conflicts that I'm suggesting here. So, how can the athletes engage people? Well, athletes, boomers like me, we have to be more patient. That's a big one, you know, because you've got a lot of things that you'll say, I, I need more time on this. And if you're a boomer, what's boomers? And, oh, you don't have more time. So on Wednesday, we have to be more uh, cheerful with you. You know how, uh, how uh, uh, people will say, you can do it. There's all this big thing about positivity now. And what are old boomers like me thinking? No, you suck. You can't. Sit down, right? That's what we're thinking. But no, you're encouraged. So we have to be understanding of that, right? And of course, I'm dealing in, in, uh, in gross uh, generalities here. But the notion is, the challenge here, the other thing that predicts value, is that these two things get along. And that's one of the th secrets, I think, to when my generation and your generation collaborate, when Americans and Chinese collaborate. I think there's something very powerful that happens in those communities. So I think of this like Sue Storm and the Thing. I'd, I, Sue Storm's one of my favorite ones. She, can, she has a force field. How many like a force field? She can read your mind. That's what I want to do. Read your mind, read my kids' mind, protect them, right? And then the Thing just smashes stuff. I'm sorry that my generation is kind of the Thing thing. We apologize, but things need to be smashed every now and then. So there is a whole worldview here. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but this is not sort of pop psychology. There's a lot of work about how you th think about time, how you think about space, what you value, what you chase, who you want to be dealing with. So these worldviews are very deep, right? And, th and they can be partially cultural, and there's a lot of uh, neurobiology that says some of this may actually be hardwired. I don't want to go there because that then you start getting into eugenics, but the notion is we are a combination of our biology and our history and our experiences, right? So there's problems. Let me tell you a problem. This comes with, with anyone who's been married for a long time will tell you that can you change the other person? Now you're all young and you think you can. Can you change? I just have to tell you, as I'm, I'm a pod from the future, you're not going to change the other person. The number one year for divorce is when? It's year one. Year one. What do you figure out in year one? They're not going to change. You either can live with this or you can't. That's it. So why am I telling you this? Because you're going to try and change these people and you can't. So what's the problem? When you get the reds in your group, what do they always do? They're very judgmental. They'll tell you the right way and the wrong way to do things, right? When you get the greens in the groups, what do they do? They have no discipline. They get up and walk away. They don't follow up. They have bad methodologies. What are the blues? The blues love to take over. The blues, have, you know, they can be boorish. Here's what we should do. Short term. Let's make the meeting five minutes. It's like a 
drive-by shooting, bang, 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 PowerPoint slides everywhere because they can't speak in complete sentences yet, right? <laughs> and finally, when you get the yellows, it's all about, oh, we can pull together, we can do, let's just have another meeting. The notion is you're going to try and change that, you can't. This is the, the downside that goes with the upside. This is what you have to deal with. Nation states also have this challenge. Now, every nation state has all four of these. And the whole idea even of nation states is kind of an old idea. But think about Japanese culture. Why were the Japanese so good at quality after the war when we invent, basically invented quality, uh, Six Sigma in New York, right? So what's been interesting is the Japanese had a 2,000-year-old tradition of Hari design. This is part of their culture, right? Think about the Netherlands. My name's the Graf, right? The Netherlands. How has the Netherlands been able to have this incredible, prosperous uh, community? It's a really small country. It's the tallest country in the world. If you know this, I'm, I'm not representing well. My mother's Hungarian. <clears throat> but the notion is because things have gone well after the war, because the Dutch can't compete on scope or scale, so they have to go out and trade. They have to invent stuff, right? Think about the United States. How did we get to be the United States? You either came here to chase Gold Mountain, you came to escape the Tsar, you came here in chains, or you thought you were here. Right? It was not exactly a picnic. Right? That's how we do things, rather ballistically. And finally, think about China, where there are over 50 words in Chinese for which uncle are you? Are you the rich uncle? Are you the crazy uncle? The uncle we avoid, the uncle we suck up to, who are you in the family? The notion is you're always going to see this, and what happens is we have a tendency to vilify the people who aren't like us. Right? instead of understanding them. And that becomes the big challenge. So we have to have the right person at the right job. Now, I'm going to, tell you, I'm going to throw some self-help stuff out the window. It's going to upset you. But I'm going to tell you what basically the research says. First, of, the assumption of type doesn't mean competency. Oh, I'm an artist, but you suck. Right? You're just not a good artist. The assumption that talent can be developed. This is my favorite one. It can be developed to a point. But you're not going to make Mozart or Michael Jordan. Those are things that are a confluence of natural talent and the situation that they find themselves in. Assumption that all types are equal. They're not. If I'm an investment banker, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to do blue stuff. If I'm a university professor, I'm trying to do yellow stuff. So the blues are going to be more valuable in one situation, the yellows in another. And finally, the assumption that balance is better. Not necessarily so. When I'm starting a project, the greens are geniuses because they love to, to, the ambiguity, make stuff as they go along. At the end, the reds are geniuses, and everybody in between is a, is a genius. Now, remember, I haven't spoken about the Xers. Xers, what their genius is at is connecting boomers and millennials. Xers are the smallest generation, but they're the most ambidextrous generation we've seen. So the only reason I talk about boomers and millennials is we're the largest generations by far, relatively. X are smaller, Gen Z are going to be smaller, but they might be the most valuable, right? And incidentally, millennials, remember this. There's more of you now than there are of us. You're on the sunny side of the hill, and if you ever figure that out politically, boy, it's going to get real interesting real fast, right? So the direction you move under stress is what people really are. So if you really want to know what somebody is, See what they do when they're really under stress. Do they go get on social media, talk to their friends? Do they shorten the field and sort of look at the three things in front? Do they look at the data? You know, do they go and weasel out of stuff and sort of go off the reservation and do all kinds of creative stuff? That will tell you what that person is. But here becomes the, the money part of this. This is the key part. How you innovate is what you innovate. How you innovate is what you innovate. You want radical innovation? You've got to embrace the artist. You want to get scale? You've got to embrace the engineer. You want to go fast? You've got to embrace the athlete. You want to build something sustainable, embrace the sage. And you need all four of these to win. So here's the biggest problems you're going to run into, and we're going to talk about the data in one second on this. The biggest problem you have is that the, the people who are in the green position are orphans. The artists are orphans. You know, the city that you're in right now, Ann Arbor, has more venture capital per person than any city in the United States. The problem is, does it relate to anything else in this state? No. You're orphans. So the problem is you've got to snuggle up to people who are trying to make a living and do things in other areas. The second problem are the blues and the yellows. And the problem is they're oppositional dogs and cats. So one, you have to really engage the conflict. And the second problem is this is by far the longest cycle of innovation. It's sometimes called Death Valley or the bottom of the bathtub. How many have been on a project that lost momentum? Anybody been on a project that lost momentum? You can sort of, and you have to platoon players in and out. Yeah, this is that part. And finally, the reds, the engineers, the problem is they're so optimized that there's no room to try anything else. And so when the new thing shows up, they're not prepared for the new things because every moment of their life is basically taken up. So we have to rely on each other. Now, the other thing that's very important about the dynamics, which is a key point, is innovation doesn't move from the inside out. It moves from the outside in. And think about this for a minute. When do people really change? When do you really change? I mean, really. Yeah, when you made a mistake, when your life sucks, when you get divorced, when you lose a job, when your house goes away, somebody close to you passes away. Why do you change when your life sucks? 
because the risk of trying something radical and the reward of staying where you're at is reversed in a crisis. Is everybody following us? Whether this is Apple trading at $3 a share in 1997, right? Whether this is Gandhi in the march to the sea, it also has a negative effect. This is also Hitler in the brown shirts. The notion is it doesn't move inside out, it moves outside in, where the middle of the organization is trying to do what? Maintain. And the outside is trying to do what? Introduce diversity. Now, the other time that people change is when? When they're in a role. You win the lottery, you got promoted, you're in love, all that stuff. Why do you try stuff then? Because the same thing. The risk of trying something radical and the reward of where you're at is reversed. Right? It's called risk capital right? in our world. And incidentally, Google, you've had a lot of risk capital over the past 10 years. A lot of risk capital. So the notion is don't launch innovation from the inside out because what will happen to that innovation is what? The organization will begin to converge it. It will begin to make it more incremental. You have to start at the perimeter. The farther away you can be from headquarters, the farther you can be away from the watchful eye, the better off you're going to be. Now, this leads us to this last slide here. This is referred to as, um, as the Schumpeter cycle. In the Schumpeter cycle, I want you to think about this for a minute. Um, first of all, organizations are created by greens, typically. They, wanna, they want to have freedom. This is, your, this is Larry and Serge. Created in a garage in Menlo, right? This is what this was. But next, we got to get money involved. And these are the people who gave you money early on, right? These are the big, the, these are the big Apollo funds and things that gave Google money at the very beginning. And they focused the two. Then what happens is you grow ballistically. We got to get the yellows on board because we got to have the right people, sell the right people, build the right community. And then we have to have, ultimately, the reds on board because we have to get to scale. Is everybody following us? Now, what's important about this? Once we get to scale, the problem is every capital committee person, every metric that we've got, every, every uh, process that we've run is designed to do what to deviance? To eliminate it. Why didn't, why didn't Sears become Amazon? Why didn't Microsoft become Google? Right? Why didn't McDonald's become Starbucks? It had nothing to do with competition. They had all the stuff in the lab. Right? You know this. The notion is, and this is the radical part of this whole discussion, what Schumpeter said is radical. And whether it, it depends on who you're talking to. We had six or seven Nobel Prize winners in economics since 1969 have talked about this. The radical part of this is that what Schumpeter said is that we're not destroyed by competitors. What Schumpeter said is we kill ourselves. We have seen the enemy and he is us. Our dominant logic becomes so strong we can't get over it. Right? And as a nation state in America, aren't we suffering from this right now? That we can't get over our dominant logic. We can't see the other. He calls this the point of creative destruction. And ironically, organizations that begin to fail quickly have a much better chance of innovating because they have to go back to the beginning of the cycle. Apple trading at $3 a share. Is everybody following us? But think about General Motors. In 1950, he had 53% of the world car market. Drip, drip, drip. It's called flatlining. So the notion is there's an interesting sort of confounding uh, part to this where even though there's tension, the best thing that can happen is when one uh, cycle shifts into the other cycle in a relatively straightforward way so we can put cause and effect together. So here's, what, here's the thing to do. I'm going to turn this over to Stanley. She's going to talk about the book and what you can do here in your work. Stop believing you can see the future. Make smaller, wider bets. Choosing big over fast. No, pick up your pace. Go faster, right? Mistaking your managers for innovators. No, encourage, encourage, uh, uh, and support your weirdos. We need weirdos. And incidentally, if you're an organization that's really green, weirdos are reds. Everybody following us? If you're a, totally, if you're a yellow organization, the weirdos are blue. They're just not like you. Having more ambition than capability, right? Talent matters. You got to go out and build on the capability you have. I love what the armed forces say. You don't fight with the army you want, you fight with the army you have, right? Which I think is great. Starting at the center and move out. It's not student body, right? It's a perimeter game. I worked on a project that you know that was originally called C2. It was, you know it as Coke Zero. I worked on Coke Zero. The problem with Coke Zero was everybody thought they had it right and they launched it as C2. We had to move it out of sight. Work it out off Broadway and bring it back and that became Coke Zero. Um, listening to the wrong people. Don't listen to the customers who are your big customers because are they going to move first? They're going to move last. Finally, failing to connect the dots. You've got to connect the dots. That's why we're here. You've got to put all four of these together. Now, the last part of this, I want Stanley to come up and talk about this. I want to talk about the book and the four steps in the book and what you can do to actually engage the constructive conflict.
Hi, so I won't, I won't bore you and I won't take too long, but the, we've created about four really simple steps for you guys to create a constructive conflict. Because the thing about it is you actually have to do this every day. It's, it's not, once you get it, it's almost like a muscle that, that you have to exercise. Once you get it, it becomes really easy. But if you've never done it before, it could be pretty awkward and could be quite difficult and actually quite, um, you know, quite intimidating to start first. So what the first thing that you have to do is really assemble a diversity of perspective. What I love about this building when Scott gave us a tour is there's so many spaces here that are very open spaces that anybody can just go to. So that's the first thing is, you know, I always talk to our clients and I would say there has to be a space where people actually can just go in and just talk to one another like a normal human being. If you put them just in cubicles and there's no way for them to go anywhere, how are they actually gonna meet other people? But this also talks about recruiting. You know, in a company, you can't just recruit one type of person or one type of skill. You might want to combine, you know, the skills you're looking for with the kind of age you're looking for, with, you know, the kind of skin color you're looking for, with the kind of background, with the kind of, you know, diversity of thought, where's this person coming from? So once you, you have to have a pool of people in which you can communicate on a regular basis. And I think this is what Jeff always talks about is, you know, I, I we have three children, and my youngest is 16, and they're always on social media. And what I do see in social media, too, is um, people start only looking, you know, my friends are my friends, and my friends have the similar view that I do, and I get frustrated when I see, like, you know, a different point of view that, to me, was attacking my point of view. I don't like that. And I know people do that. You know, we, we have our own niches, and that's actually quite dangerous for what we want to do. You know, we should just open up and start talking, have a conversation with somebody else who's very different from us. Um, I was just talking to uh, my intern, and she was talking about, how do you meet new people? And I said, well, I used just to go to cafes. And there are a lot of people in cafes. She's just like, I've never met any new person in a cafe. I'm like, it's a totally different world now. I totally get that. But I think that's why like, you actually have to make the first step. And um, so this is like the kind of types of the four colors that you can find. Usually engineers are very organized, so they can be scientists, analysts, those kind of things, and sages are teachers and so forth. So you can look at that. But the second step is then you have to actually engage it. So we're talking about if we're doing brainstorming, for example, to solve a particular idea or a particular challenge in your organization, you know, gather everybody and make sure that they're all the four colors. And then put in one space, one room, and then just engage. You actually have to talk. This is what Jeff is talking about. If you, do not, if you do not agree with something, that's it. I don't agree with that. You don't have to be mean. You can be respectful, but you have to engage. And I think, um, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but I also noticed that in my children, um, especially the 16-year-old, he doesn't like conflict. So he doesn't like telling people, I don't agree with you. And it's easier for him to do it in social media and to write something about it, instead of just walking to the person and say, I really disagree. And this is actually a skill that you have to do. You actually have to engage that with this open-mindedness and conversation. It's really when we, when we create a cognitive dis dissonance in our brain, and then we start thinking about new things. So one of the things that we also talk about is talk about, like, use this and say what works and what doesn't work, and go through the four colors to see what's working and what doesn't right now and to figure out what solutions we can, we can come up with. And when you get into a really big conflict and you feel like you're stuck, the third thing that you have to do is really make sure that you establish that shared goal of vision. Keep on reminding everyone why you're there. Why are you in this room? We are trying to solve that particular problem. And just kind of stick with it. Because I, if everybody has the same goal and everybody agrees with that same goal and they can remove their ego, I think that's a big thing from the, um, from the situation. We might be able to come out with something. And um, the, the fourth one is just then you have to construct the hybrid solution. So brainstorm a lot of arrays of good ideas and, and select the best ideas from the four colors and try to see, can I put the green one with the red one? Can I put the blue one in the yellow one? And we put some, uh, some ideas and some methods in the book. You can use metaphors. You could use different kind of a creativity idea and that we can put up together. And basically the idea is let's not compromise. Let's not choose one idea to another. Let's figure out a way that we can ascend all this, get all disagreement together, listen to one another, create a bond, 
and learn how to communicate with another and then come up with a better solution. Jeff? Oh. Well, thank you. Let's finish up here. So what's the point? Take a higher point of view. Right? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard with all of the, the, all the anger. It's hard to get to a higher point of view. But do you, have you noticed people, uh, adults are starting to do that now. They're starting to say, you know, even though I might be a little bit on this side of the center line, the people who are a little bit on the other side of the center line make a lot of sense. We can have a conversation about that. And finally, I want you to remember the DeGraff hypothesis, which is probably what they'll remember <laughs> on my tombstone. Out of all the stuff I've done in my life, the amount of innovation an organization produces is inversely related to the number of stupid PowerPoint slides or elaborate process diagrams it makes about innovation. In the, in the old uh, words of Phil Knight, you just have to do it. So I want to take us, first I want to thank you for having us here. I want to take a second and take some questions, if we could. I know we're a little over time, but I want to take questions because I, I know that this is a, a very, uh, very uh, counterintuitive view of how innovation works. And what we didn't talk about here, I took it out of the slide deck, is we did a number of, uh, uh, we did a lot of analysis on the stock market is what it came down to, starting in 1993 and more effectively in, 2000, in 2010. And we started looking at these kind of indicators for contrarian uh, points of view and what happened with the organizations that had uh, high scores in these opposite areas, it turns out that they outperformed everybody else. And this growth index that we've talked about that uh, almost no one's beat, I think we've only lost to it like a half a dozen times over the years. So the notion is it's more than just a typology or a style. There's really sort of an analytical engine underneath that. So with that, let's take some questions. So pushback, please. Thank you. So here in the office, we're broken up between floor, yep. um, and those correspond to the different verticals that we support yep. um, across North America. Um, on my floor, um, there's a lot of innovation that happens because we have a lot of freedom to pitch an idea, pitch a project, and run with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, given your <coughs> hypothesis and the studies you've done, how can leaders or owners of projects best identify these opposite colors um, to best, I guess, to make the best team? Yeah, I think the, the easy answer to that is see what people do under stress or duress. And that was that kind of throwaway slide I had. But if, if you've got somebody who's primarily a sage, they're going to be extroverted. They're going to be highly interactive. So when they have a problem, they're going to consult other people, right? When you've got somebody who's, a, who's an athlete, when they get a problem, what they'll do is they'll shut other people out. They're the opposite of team people. They'll take a lot of ownership and they'll, they'll get rid of things in their life. You'll notice it's like spring cleaning and they'll focus on one or two things. They're very goal oriented. When you're looking at somebody who's, um, who's an engineer, they'll want to go back and look at the data and they'll think sequentially about the data and they'll think about sort of combing through where the error was and how to appreciate how to fix the error. And if you've got somebody's agreeing, they'll talk, what you'll see them do is look for escape routes. They're kind of wiggly. Does this make sense? Because they're very imaginative. They know how to tell a tale in an interesting way and they'll try and escape. So when I look at people, one of the things I pay close attention to is what do people do when they're stressed out? Does this make sense to you? And if you really want to make things successful, I think the big thing is what do we constitute as success? So one of the things I notice in places like Google is people when they do a small experiment are highly successful because it's, very, it's a very artist organization. The real question becomes what? How does that make it into something that's scalable? And the irony of Google is what? And this is sort of the hard truth of this. You have all these different businesses. How many make money? How many of the businesses make money? Is everybody following us? <laughs> yeah, don't think we don't know, right? And the notion is those are places that have effectively engaged the reds and the blues, right? So there's got to be a place. And this was the problem when I was young. In my, I, was a, I was an advisor what's called Applied Integrated Systems at Apple. The problem with Apple in the beginning days was it was very much like here, but they couldn't figure out how to make money. They couldn't figure out how to get quality sorted out. Does this make sense? So when Jobs came back, what did he learn? He learned how to make money and get quality sorted out. So this is the issue of it can be successful, but to be successful all the way through the cycle, you have to look for these different types. Now, there's a, there's a place in the book you can go and take the assessment. There's all kinds of material online. If you go to, if you go to uh, innovatrium.org or jeffdegraff.com, there's tons of stuff. I think I've written over the years like 800 articles. You know, a lot of books and there's a lot of uh, tools on there. And no one will ever bother you. But the notion is if you want to do something more with it, there's a way to do that. But there's a card game. 
Yeah, I could give some. I have some card games. If you want a card, I'll give you a card game when we're done here. Do and what's fun about the card game is just ask a person, pick a card, and tell me what you're insanely great at. And people are pretty self-aware. They'll go, I'm insanely great at this. Go, great, that's great. Have someone else who pick a card. You're the opposite. Okay, the two of you are now going to work on this. Now, here's the challenge, the real challenge, because we do this every day in the innovation labs. Some of the biggest innovations people write about. The biggest challenge is keeping the conflict constructive, right? And I, I put it to you this way. I have what I call Big Jeff days and Little Jeff days. Big Jeff days, I'm very open to constructive conflict. Little Jeff days, you ever get in that mood where you're like, oh, God, I can't, I can't deal with this person today. Now, I'm, and I'm not rude, and I'm not going to fight in a negative way. I'm just going to disengage. I'm going to say, today, today, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in my life, and I love you, and I want to work with you, but today, I'm taking a holiday. I'm, I'm getting off the grid today. So part of it is knowing to do that. I think it's also a good life skill when you have a partner, right? Someone else. Hey, so uh, you talked a lot about the power of tension and the create a power of constructive conflict. And uh, I think most people would agree that uh, America's in a heightened state of tension yeah. and, and divide it nowadays. Sure is. So I'm curious what you would recommend or how can we harness this tension productively? I think, I think uh, it's sort of the opposite of the bell curve. I think what's happening is actually twofold. First of all, I think the conflict that we're having is a conflict that we've needed to have since the 1980s. And the way I would uh, characterize the conflict is when I looked at the, before the election, I was at one of the big government agencies giving this talk. Um, and so I'm not trying to be political, I'm trying to illuminate something here. Um, and I said, I thought that tr Trump may very well win the election, which of course was contrary to what everybody said. And they said, why? And I said, think about Belker. Who got blown out after the 08 recession? There were, there were four groups that got blown out. The first group were young people. You guys got blown out, it was bad, it was really bad. The second was old people who were on retirement. They got blown out. And I, the penny dropped when I was at a, uh, I walked by a Bernie rally here on campus, and I'd never seen young people with old people before. This was like, and I pay attention. I'm one of those guys who pays a lot of attention to incongruities and went, wow. Well, think about it. Those are two groups that are one end of the bell curve that got blown out. The other groups that got blown out were people of color, right? Think about all, the, all the, the groups in the United States. And a lot of those groups didn't vote. They disengaged, right? Look at the numbers. And then I need you to think about um, people who look like me who are from neighborhoods like where I'm from. And they've been downwardly mobile since about 83. And the notion is their real economic power, you know, their lack of education, their mortality rate. Look at anything right now in those numbers. And they were really mad. Out of all of those groups, only one of them voted. Does this make sense? And they voted big, right? So when we start looking at the numbers, what I, what I looked at was who's actually going to act, which is an innovation question. Is this making sense to you? Yeah. So now the opposite of that is how this will come together is you start looking at the middle of the bell curve and you draw a line. What's happening is reasonable people, which constitute about the 80% of the middle, are starting to talk to each other. So I think about being in a business school. Business school is filled with a lot of University of Chicago people, very conservative economic. They read The Economist every day in the journal. It's a little right for me. You know, and then there's other people in the school, you know, read, the, you know, read The Times every day, Bloomberg every day, a little left. I, I read The Post. I'm kind of down the, sort of that guy, down the middle. You know, I'm, but, but the notion is you're starting to see those people come together. The majority, is this making sense to you? Yeah. And they're starting to say, we're going to have to take care of some of these things that we haven't taken care of. So there are issues, of, there are social issues and there are economic issues and both of those issues. I believe what you're starting to see is that come together. I think what will happen is this will be horribly painful for the next 18 months for both sides. Nobody's going to win this. But it's a, it's, a, it's a kitchen, it should have started as a kitchen discussion and it's now a fight that's kind of calming down. That's my interpretation of what's happening. And I think at the end of this, and that this is because remember, Conflict, even if it's not constructive, will often result in innovation. I think we will have to get to a new place. Is, that, is everybody following this? Thank you. So that's my take on it. But I, I can imagine being young and seeing this ringside. It's, it's, uh, it's not any, and it's, and it's, when people compare this to, uh, just drop the comparisons to Hitler or to Watergate. These, this is a whole different animal. And, and I think a lot of those metaphors or analogies are, don't work. 
I think we're looking at a world that's connected both vertically and horizontally. And I think the horizontal connections are so much stronger in your generation. I think it's going to be very different. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, um, what's your perspective on the historical cycles of innovation? Um, even in terms of nostalgia, as an example, this year with all this turmoil, people are looking back to the 1980s, things like that. Um, yeah. What do you think about as the decades Yeah, passed? I'd like to say that I don't think they exist, but I do think they exist. Um, here, here's, there's a very famous book written at the end of the 1800s um, by Oswald Spangler. And Spengler basically, it's a book called The Decline of the West. And Spengler is this German academic who basically gets it. He's really, he starts showing what's going to happen. And what's amazing is he predicts the First World War and the Second World War. And the reason he predicts them is he understands the cycle. So he's looking at cycles. And economies happen in cycles. So, um, so the part that I would say I disagree is that we're in a very different accelerated age with all of this horizontal, what I call longitude connection, the network world. Niall Fer Neil Ferguson's new book, you know, The Square and the Tower, right? That stuff. And I think that's true, uh, at least to some degree. I think the other, but the other thing is human nature is human nature. And what happens in human nature is you develop a, a, a theory of, of, of a new theory of governance, <clears throat> and over time, that theory uh, decays into the very thing it tried not to do. This is what Weber wrote about 1984. This is what Orwell wrote about. The animals are all going to be equal, and then they become Stalinist. Right? Does this make sense to you? So yes, I think there is something to cycles. I think predicting, when people start predicting how many years they're going to be, like the Russians do, or how big they're going to be, then I think it gets a little iffy. Am I making sense? So, so in, in summary, yes, I think there are cycles. But I think the cycles are a little less predictive than people think they are. Did I answer your question? What do you think? That's my question. What do you think? I think, I think that when innovation happens for a few years, people accept that all this change happened and then maybe calm down for a few years because they're riding the wave of the changes that took place, you know, technology birth. Did, did you read, um, <clears throat> the woman's name is Jackson. She's the, the um, CEO, or not CEO, the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic. Did you read her book on innovation cycles? She basically points something out that I think is very damning. She said that most of the wave which your company was built on was w sort of ended in the mid-90s and that what we've been doing is iterations of that wave for a long time. And I know that when people start talking about like collaborative open innovation networks, I, I worked on AppleNet which became iTunes. I mean that's what, 84, 85, right? You start thinking about what people talk about is now. The Innovatrium was built 10 years before we work. So the notion is when you start looking at where the genesis of things are, and you, particularly, you know where this is really fun? Music, right? I'm, I grew up in the 70s, and people went to high school in the 70s. And you know, people say, well, you know, what happened? You give all the music genres that people listen to now, and they all happen in the 70s. Is this making sense to you? So the 90s, the 70s, 90s for technology, 70s for music, the issue becomes at what point is that long cycle done, right? And usually it has to be disruptive to be done. But you're, I think you're seeing disruption. There's, I come back to what I talked about. Maybe you weren't in the room. We talked about the disruption, disruption of institutions. You know, marriage is different now. Religion is different now. Um, what work is is different now. Universities will soon be different now. Trust me, they will. Medicine will be different now. And I think those are more subtle long cycles. Anyone else? One more. Uh, <laughs> kind of going back to what you're talking about with, like, contrarian indicators and yep. how you saw that these companies far outperformed any others. Yep. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight as how we can distill that down and take that back to like our teams, put that to work for us. Um, I think what I would recommend is I'd read the book, right? And I'd say uh, one of the things that, uh, that the book will give you clues about, some of this obviously I can't open up the whole can of worms here, so I don't want to overcommit to something. Yeah. But you'll notice that there are a list of attributes that could easily be turned into key indicators that you could follow. And then I'd ask you to do some of your own research okay. to say well, if you get some of these contrary and key indicators. And I think in, in uh, pardon, can you answer that? Yeah. OK, I can speak a little bit toward that. So we wanted to see if the culture differences in the four quadrants, the four colors, would, would appear also in company performances. So we looked through 20 years of data. 
But what's interesting to me when we looked at the companies who do well over there, it, again, it's like they do well red and green and then blue and yellow. And when four of them are showed up at the same time, that's better. So you can be very good at blue and you can, uh, you can be very good at green and you can be good at red, but when you're good at both, your value is multiplied. That's what I'm trying to say. So what does that mean? When I saw the data, the data, the hard data actually is telling me that you have to have your basics down. So this is especially good for you guys for Google because you, you are based on algorithm. So your reds have to be very, very strong. But then on top of that, you have to have these loose process, these you know, groups of people who, who can take it to the next place to look at future growth. But it is in these combinations, I think in particular, more uh, from my research, look much more relevant and much more vibrant than the, you, the blue and yellows have to hold it together. But for me, the, what I saw mostly is the red and green. I also think if you go back and look at some of the earlier books that I've done, there's a lot of clues in there about very specific things to measure. Obviously, it gets a little more, I'm, we're making this overly simple to make the concept accessible because there's a lot of interdependencies, there's a lot of yeah. complexity under the hood, just like your business, right? And some of the stuff is of great interest to Wall Street and not to normal people, and some stuff's no, more interest to people who are governance. If you read the book, then the next step is maybe read this book, Leading Innovation, which I wrote, I don't know, 15 years ago. Then I think the interesting thing would be, then if you have some, you run it for a while, I'd be interested to see how, I'd be interested in hearing from you, what happens, what'd you find, right? That would be of interest to me. Uh, Making Stone Soup has a really great formula too. Yeah, there's a thin book that, I, that uh, we wrote for um, jump starting in the labs. I don't know if you know this, the University of Michigan has a Certified Professional Innovator Program, which we created. Right, so that's the first certificate program they ever did. It's through the School of Engineering, right? Um, we wrote a book for it called Making Stone Soup. And it's a, I think it's like $7 and, you know, on, it's on they Android. It's funny, it's all, But it's, it's, uh, it's a great way to start. That's a great point, Lindsay. It's a great way to start. It's easy. It's easy way to start. So, and that, like I said, the, the challenge of this is it's so easy that people think it's like a, a disc test or a Myers-Briggs test. The challenge is if you start going down that road, what I'm suggesting to you is you start by a beginner, if you read as a beginner. But if you want to go all the way down the road, I mean, that's something you can do also with just the resources that are publicly available. It can get a lot more sophisticated a lot faster. Anything else? Thank you. I appreciate you hanging out here to the end. I, uh, and good luck with all this. And thanks for having us out.